Neck throughs, guitars, they're like a guy that won't have a beer with you. I want to hear what's pushing the notes. Freddie King and B.B. King, Albert King, and let's not forget Burger King. I don't want to blow my knuckle out. Stainless steel is the work of the devil. These go to 11. From the East Amplification Tone Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, it's the Amps and Axes Show. With your hosts, Jeff the Godfather of Low Wattage Amps Bober and Mick Marcelino. Well, good day to you, Mr. Bober. Good day to you, Mr. Marcelino. How be you? Oh, we're well, just lovely here. That's right. It's and always we, lovely and here. And we always have to thank our listeners for all the cool downloads they're doing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are just killing it, man. Kicking ass. Yes. Totally. And, uh, you know, uh, just spread the love. Absolutely. <laughs> Click through everything, spread the love. Yes. Go to ampsandaccesscast.com. And uh, make sure you click on all the cool social media, follow us all and all that stuff. Right. Then, of course, you know, if you feel like you want to buy something, go through that Amazon banner. Yep. They kick it back to us a little bit. Doesn't cost you an extra cent. No, nope. it keeps the lights on for us. Yes. And if you scroll down just a little bit, you're going to see our buddy. Jason Sedidus. That's right. Quick lick. Mm-hmm. There you go. And uh, he's got that GNL just yeah just cranking it. Yeah, and he's, um, he's the guy. He uh, he and I are doing a little project together, not musically, because I <laughs> just couldn't sit in the chair next to him and play guitar. Oh, you it's could just do that, not yeah. that's, that's you not could. that's it's not gonna happen, brother. Maybe. It's not gonna happen. It's not gonna happen. But we're um, you know, I, I we're we're doing something in the way of technology, and I'm not gonna let the whole thing out of the bag right now. But yeah, we actually um, talked about this. The other yeah, day. we did. We did. So uh, yeah, Jason Jason had a very cool idea, and he's got a. He's got a very great ear, and uh, we're uh, we're entering the uh, the world of technology, musical technology, and uh, I'm just going to leave it there for now. Yeah. And uh, as it progresses, uh, I'll leak a little more about it. Cool. So yeah, it's 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 fun. It's a fun project, man. Yeah. Well, it's fun. You know, I'm sure between you two, it'll be uh, well worth it. Yes. Yes. Oh, it will. <laughs> it will. And it'll yeah. be it'll be the best out there. So. And then and that's cool because I know what I know what it is. So we're just gonna we'll just tease the hell out of you. There you that's go. That's what we're gonna there do. We just go. tease it. It's it's called a teaser in the in the uh, in right. the audio world. That's right. <laughs> Although we don't have to follow any FCC rules, so we can do whatever the hell we want. Hey, uh, <laughs> speaking of which, um, have you seen the new Epiphone from uh, Tony Iommi, the limited run? Yes, yes, I saw. You sent that over to me, and I and I, but I mean, I didn't know if you really got a good look at it or anything. I, I I the first thing I saw was the uh, the the complete pickup covers, no pole pieces. Yeah, that's been his signature pickup for. They actually, so it's kind of weird. Gibson made so this is not the first time. So Gibson made a Gibson SG that was a signature model. Okay, and um, it had some of his appointments on it, uh, like the output jack is on the side of the guitar, not on the face. Okay. Uh, all SGs, mm -hmm. quote unquote, uh, the the output jack is on the front. Right. You have to use a right angle plug. Not that you shouldn't use a right angle plug on all Gibsons, <laughs> but um, that's where it is, right? So he he moved it to the side. Now okay. this was an old Gibson run, and I don't know if they didn't sell or they were very limited. I I don't know. Well, anyway, this one, the Epiphone, is pretty close to that one. Okay. Right. So uh, the they, they did one once before and it was 24 frets, but the crosses stopped at the 12th fret. It looked weird. Wow. Yeah. So they did the third, the fifth, the seventh, the ninth, and the 12th. 12th. Right. And no more. <laughs> and it was like, well, that's just strange. Well, does, does he never play up there? Oh, no. He, <laughs> you know, he does. You he know. does yes. So <laughs> this one, the crosses go all the way to the 24th fret. And we had this discussion the other day. Gibson SGs to put 24 frets on it, it doesn't require changing the neck per se in the sense of the actual length of it. 
if you look at an SG between the rhythm of the neck pickup and the fingerboard, there's this little black cover. It's, held it's, on with it's two part screws. of the plastic uh, pick guard, right? Some some are part of the pick guard. Some are, are mine is actually separate. Separate. It's two screws holding it on. Yeah. But it's 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 pick guard material to cover the tenon of right. the neck. Right. Right. So I guess he just said it's horrible. Mm-hmm. You know. So he said put two more frets on there. Right. And two frets go in that space. Right up to the neck pickup. Exactly. Yeah. And it's got the long tenon. So the, the tenon goes all the way to that bottom of that pickup. Mm-hmm. You know, if you were going towards the tailpiece. Right. Right. It's got the thin 60s profile neck. Mm-hmm. It's bound fingerboard. It looks like he's got um, probably a, a graph tech nut, nut on okay. that thing. Super slippery. You know, mm-hmm. it's it, it is a Korean made guitar because, okay. you know, it's coming from right, Epiphone. Right. So uh, Dave Dunwoody and all those guys at Graph Tech, they, they sell, I think, every guitar that comes out of Korea has those nuts on there. Mm-hmm. So that's probably why it's got sealed gears. They're not lockers. His guitar actually has locker gears on. He has Spurs oh, okay. L's or well, Spurs L's or however it, you want to pronounce it. You know what? that's something that's easily done aftermarket and oh, you know yeah. you, you got to meet a price point with an epiphone exactly and they're i mean they're well-made guitars yeah they you know, well, especially a, you know a, a nice bound neck on the thing and, yeah you know, it's, and it's an ebony fingerboard yeah on yeah. top of that so you get more stability out of that neck than you do if you bought an sg it just doesn't make sense to me sometimes and it's got his gibson signature pickups which those things are not cheap i priced them out they're really? like 150 dollars a pickup uh, and crazy loud they're not active Wow. One bobbin ceramic, the other one's one Alnico, ceramic, right? One is ceramic, one is Alnico, yeah. Yeah. 13.7K, I said. Wow, that's a hot pickup. Considering that my 57, my classic 57s, which are ba- based off of a PAF, are mm-hmm. like 7.8. Yeah, yeah. That's like huge difference. Yeah. Uh, you would push the front of your amplifier to the back. Right. You know, with that kind of, that's almost like an active. True. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like having a little preamp boost i'm sure pedal, it like is a clean boost well not so much clean because at that point you know there's probably there's probably not a lot of clean artifact in that pickup you i know? can't I mean, imagine well he's a metal guy right know? right they don't really clean up too much right now the one thing that we talked about was the uh strap button for the uh for the uh, near the neck right for the top belt right on Tony's guitars, and I researched it. I went in, looked at pictures all the way back in the seventies. He was taking a screw and putting it through the top horn, like you would on right, a strap, right through the point. Yes. Yeah. And it's the weirdest looking thing because the button, of course, has this. I don't know what would you say, three eighths base, three eighths of an inch base, mm-hmm. right? So it sticks over the edges of yeah, this Yeah, it's not really resting on much wood. Not much at all. No. It's a very thin piece of mahogany. But he does it. Mm-hmm. You know? But Tony does not jump around. True. And so the True. Epiphone is done the way the traditional is, where it goes through the back of the tenon of the body, oh, okay. right behind the neck. Because I have a picture of him playing it. Uh, but I, I looked at mine, and I thought about it for about... Mm, three yeah. mississippi and i mm-hmm. said no that's not gonna happen yeah that's... get yourself a nice wide suede back strap it could be leather on the front you know the, the finished leather right make sure it's got suede guitar doesn't go anywhere yeah yeah because with with the button where it is on the uh, behind the neck it gets a little heavy it gets a little headstock little neck. heavy yeah, yeah a little neck heavy yep so that's it and guess what they i think there's there's a limited run i forget what it is um, eight hundred bucks. Yeah, seven ninety nine or something. Yeah, that's like that's. Uh, that's pretty like cool. A, yeah, uh, it's 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 more than some Epiphones that they typically do, and you yes. know, of course, you, you know, it's a signature model, so you know, mm-hmm. you you have to pay Mister Iommi a couple dollars, you know, I'm and sure. then it seems like they're putting the real deal pickups in it. Yeah, I'm not. I wouldn't swear to it. I didn't read all the specs, but it may have a Tone Pros bridge on it too. So that's even crazier. Yeah. That you're getting all those appointments for that low price. But I'm starting to see that out of a lot of companies. You know, Ibanez has a Korean line. Well, I don't know if it's Korean or Indonesia. They're they're kind of hand in hand right now. Mm-hmm. The Indonesians and the and the Koreans with the guitar building. Uh for lower lower cost but right. higher quality. Mm-hmm. Like Schechter, 
their guitars, they're coming out. They got, you know, Grover tuning machines. They've got EMG pickups, Seymour Duncan pickups, DeMarzio pickups, the real deal. They're wow. not like fake knockoffs from China. These are the actual pickups and they're putting them in these guitars. The pots are good. I mean, that, and, this and, is this and, is what people usually do when they pick up an Epiphone or yeah, some kind of import. They end up you, putting all these pickups and stuff you, in you, them. Right. Yeah. You, you strip the, the cheap stuff and you put good stuff in. And, now and then it's a pretty damn good guitar. And they're beating you that for under right. a thousand bucks. Yeah, it's crazy. That is crazy. So if, wow. you, if you can get one, get one. I know it's limited. Yeah. I was thinking about getting one. I know you were. Because, <laughs> you know, it, it would be a nice compliment to what you already have. Yeah, yeah, know? it would be like... And, and, and they make them in right-handed models. Yes, they do. Well, because it would be a very limited audience. <laughs> yes, it would. Yes, it would. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Um, speaking of audience, audience, uh, just, a, just a real quick note. Yes. Because we got to get to our guests. But um, we're, we're, we're taking this on a road show, man. We're taking this on the road I'm excited. Show. We yeah. got our new H Zoom H6. Yep. Thanks to our buddy Jude Gold. Hey, he turned you on to that. Oh thing, man, that man. thing is awesome. And uh, we're we're taking it out. We are we are going to take this party to the um, Nashville Guitar Amp Expo. I think it's November 13th through 15th. Um, at a, at a really cool hotel, right on the outskirts of Nashville. Yes. It's um, <laughs> uh, there are. I think they're into the fourth floor already of demo rooms. That's sweet. And you know, I don't know if you if if anybody knows anything about these shows. They've been they've been going on for a, a bunch of years now. It turned out it started as just um, an amp show because mm -hmm. we were all pissed off at at NAMS where you got the the volume police with the SPL meters that that all yeah. lie, you know. And uh, so we were all pissed off about that. So a couple of these couple guys started amp shows in mm -hmm. hotels. And um, there ain't no volume limits. Yes, and I remember you telling me what was it? What was the cost that one year when you were with Buddha? You, oh, for Nam, it's, it's, it's something ridiculous. And then you got to get there. You got to get all the gear there. It was crazy and that then, number the, you gave. Me. Yeah, and then you've then you know the the gear has to get handled yeah. once it's in the building by you a know, certain like, like Freeman Company and all you know oh, so yeah. the, the costs are just astronomical to do it and that's yeah. that's why everybody you know especially a lot of what you'll find at the these amp shows or it's now it's music gear show because it's gotten so big that's cool um you know it's not only amps it's guitars it's pickups it's effect, lots of effects I'm sure every pedal uh, guy in the world will be there. Oh, absolutely you know um but for for boutique guys, which you'll find mostly boutique at these things, which is awesome, because where can you see all these boutique builders in one place? Yeah, you can't. You can't. Yeah, you know. Um, so that's what's really cool about it. Um, and you don't have to worry about the sound police. No, so it's just um, just wear the earplugs at the wizard. Yes, uh, the wizard room. Or if you happen to be directly across from them, as we were. But um, love those guys. Love all of them. Uh, and it's such a <laughs> cool just, thing. All they do is build cannons. Right, that look like guitar amplifiers, uh, cannons with tubes. Right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll be touting this as the weeks go on, yes. and it's uh, like I said, November thirteen through fifteen, I think. And uh, it's gonna be awesome. You know, if, I'm just if, gonna be mixing for rest of my life. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna be doing, just putting shows together. Yeah, because we have a we have a room just for uh, amps and axes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. So, and I'll be there with East as well. So, yeah, double duty. It's going to be awesome. It is. It's going to be awesome. Speaking of awesome, we got an awesome guest. And now, th can... this is one that I've, I, I thought we'd never get. Uh huh. You know what I mean? I just, I just, I, I, I threw it out there. Mm -hmm. It was literally like a clay pigeon. I just shot it in the air, and I wanted to see what would happen. Got right back to me. And he came out with a shock, then went boom. And then here I like, am. Yeah, I'll be on. Sure. It's like, oh my god. Sure. <laughs> and um. Uh, this guy's been around for a while, man. He, and he's, he's one of the uh, originals. He's, he is one of the originals. Yeah. Absolutely. A yeah, uh, shrapnel guy, right? Yes. One of the originals. Mike Varney, yep. the whole thing. Yep. And then, uh, you know, uh, recorded on uh, Jason Becker's album after he uh, got ALS and came down with that. Yes. And he's because he's about one of the only ones that can do it. True. True. <laughs> And has, has recorded with a lot of great people and um, oh, yeah. and you know solo stuff and and all. I'm I'm not going to go on because um, we're going to let him do all the talking. Yes. So we're going to come right back with our guest of the week, somebody that Mick is happy <laughs> to have, Mr. Greg Howe. <laughs> 
this is Johnny Balmer from Alchemy Audio. I'm listening to Amps and Axes when I'm in the shop, voiding warranties on effects pedals, and you should be too. Okay, we're back, and as promised, our guest of the week, the one, the only, Mr. Greg Howe. Greg, how are you doing, sir? Doing great. Excellent, excellent. I'm a huge fan. Oh, me too. I mean, me too. I just, you know, I, yeah. I, I got that introspection album years ago. Wow. And I just never, I had the tape. Here, I'll tell you this story. Okay. I had the tape, literally wore it away. It wouldn't play anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, when, you know, in a car stereo, if you don't have, when you, as the newer ones came up, it would just play the other side. You didn't have to take it out and flip it over and put right, it in, right? Right, right, right. Well, the, the tape... auto reverse. Yeah, the tape would automatic. you know, it'd start pushing to one side of the thing until it just <laughs> never turned again, <laughs> you know? So then That's I got, I, I had to go get the CD. Of course. And... In the I, new technology. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I was just... The one thing that always amazed me, and of course we can do our thing that we normally do, but the one thing that always amazed me about that was... I'd never heard somebody prior to him play 12 songs or 10 songs, whatever's on that album. I think it's 10. It, it just never repeated the same lick twice. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I was like, wow. that's an hour of music. That's an hour <laughs> of music. And I haven't heard the same thing. He's, repeated. he's the Angus Young of shred. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that man takes like six notes and doesn't repeat a lick all night. You know? Is it it's, crazy? It's, it's, and they've made 13 of the exact same albums. <laughs> and it's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. But it anyway, we're, we're, we're going off topic here. I'm cause, sorry. That cause, was my cause, homage Because we have Greg Howe to speak about yes, you know, that's now. True. And, and as I always do, Greg, um, I like to take a trip in the Wayback Machine and find out where our guest comes from and what put the music bug in their in their DNA. So... Tell us a little bit about Greg Howe, where you came from, where you, where you were born, and uh, what was your earliest uh, memory of a musical experience that turned you into this incredible musician. Give us a little. Sure. Um, I don't really know. You know, the, the thing about music is that I don't remember a time when it wasn't a part of my life. So I don't mm -hmm. even know if I can, if I'll be able to pinpoint specifically when that all occurred. But I will try to go back as far as I can. Uh, to just see, see how far back I can remember things. Sure. But uh, I, yeah, I was born in New York City and we, I kind of, uh, I think until the age of three, lived in New York. Actually, we, had mo we moved to Nyack, which is a suburb of New York. And, uh, and then we eventually moved to Washington, New Jersey uh, when I was four. So I don't have a whole lot of memory about anything before uh, we moved to Washington, New Jersey, except that I do remember we had a guitar in the house. It was an acoustic guitar. And um, I was always just intrigued by it. And I didn't really know how to play it, but I, I always understood music. So I would pick it up and I would try to make some kind of noise with it and uh, sort of got a, sort of got the concept of how the how the fretboard works. At least, no, it, at least it, I could get the correlation that if I push down a fret here, the note goes up in pitch. If I push it down here, it goes up higher or goes lower. So cool. I would screw around with, with things like that. Mm -hmm. But as far as music and loving music, the, the interesting thing is that I always understood what it was. I mean, no harmony. I always understood how to harmonize. I understood rhythms. Um, and there was always an instinctual sort of creative thing. So my brother, who's two years younger than I am, we used to actually write songs together before we could even play instruments and <laughs> sounds a little just, bizarre <laughs> it was strange yeah it was really odd and uh i can remember that sometimes he'd be singing a song and i'd be humming the sort of bass note of the perceived chord change you know whatever whatever the chord change would have been over that melody line mm -hmm. i'd be humming the bass notes to that or in some cases literally harmonizing with him but it was really interesting that we were we, we we both understood music and it wasn't until a little bit later that my father who was really just starting to get frustrated with the, with the idea that we were always grabbing this guitar and grabbing anything we could to, to try to make noise with it he finally said you guys have to learn how to really play an instrument and get serious about this 
Um, what, was he a player? Was that why the guitar was always in the house? or? No, uh, the guitar was just there, and I don't exactly know why. I think, huh. although there is a... There is a picture that we have of me opening a guitar, for, uh, you know, for Christmas or something. So it may have been mine, um, but I, you know, it's, it all, it's all a bit fuzzy back then. Mm -hmm. I just, what I do know is that I, I liked the idea of the guitar um, as, when we got a little bit older and we started getting into the bands like the Beatles and uh, you know Stevie Wonder. Um, songwriting became something that we just did, and then eventually, my, you know. My father said, "You guys have to take lessons if you if you're going to do this." So he he literally I remember this. He said, "Who wants to play drums?" And I really wanted to play drums because I again we had a small. There was a Christmas that we had gotten a toy drum kit, and I was really good at playing it. When I say really good, I was the guy who know who knew how to sort of play the kick drum, the hi hat, and the snare, and keep a beat. And you know, I could do I could mimic Ringo Starr or yeah. you know simple drum and, and simple that, drum. that that something that simple actually does take a lot of coordination it oh really yeah does. it does yeah yeah and so we even had a situation i remember this because my brother you know he was good at singing and he was good at writing but he he really never jumped on an instrument but we had a tape recorder so sometimes we would do this thing where i'd have the, the drum set in front of me i'd play the kick drum and then i'd hit the hi-hat for the snare for the two and four and while I'm strumming chords, and then my brother and I would sing something, we'd record that into the tape recorder, and then we'd play the tape recorder back, and as it's playing back, we'd, I'd play different things on the guitar, and we'd harmonize with what we'd already done, so we were sort of doing our own little version of multi-track. Totally. Uh, That's cool. <laughs> it was it's, weird. It's, it did his own Les Paul thing, you know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, so when my father said, you guys you know, have to learn how to play something, who wants to play drums? My, my brother raised his hand first, and uh, sort of by default, I got, I got the guitar thing. Wow. So my brother took drum lessons, but didn't really pursue it. I took guitar lessons and didn't learn anything. I took about three guitar lessons, learned nothing. It was, uh, it was the you know, classic Mel Bay thing where you're, you're learning these little kind of corny songs mm -hmm. and melody lines, and they're really trying to teach you uh, really how to read music and how to correlate uh, the sound of notes with with the visual look of them. Right. And uh, the, one of the problems was I had a good ear, so I didn't need to read something in order to know what it should sound like. So when I remember this specifically. The teacher would give me some uh, some homework, and I'd go learn how to... I'd learn the song. I'd come back the next week. He'd say, okay, can you play through this section of the song? And I'd just pretend to be reading it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then We've I'd heard be, this before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pretend to be reading it, and then I'd just be playing it. Um, and it didn't matter what it was. But in the point, and, and really, honestly, it, was not, it had nothing to do with what I was interested in with the guitar. I mean, we were at that point watching Don Kirshner's rock concert, you know, we were big fans of the Beatles, big fans of the Rolling Stones, big fans of Sly and the Family Stone, big fans of all these really cool bands that were happening when I was a young kid in the 70s. <clears throat> and I wanted to do that. I wanted to sound like Pete Townsend. I wanted to make noise with the guitar. I didn't want to be playing single note melodies. That's not that had nothing to do with what Keith Richards was doing. Right. That's not rock and roll. Yeah, um. exactly. <laughs> And, and that was the thing. And my parents eventually had some foster kids that stayed with us. And one of one of us, one of them was about 16 years old, played guitar. And he's really the guy that showed me open chords, showed me how to play the, the open D and G and A. And that was it. To me, that was everything I wanted. I just wanted to be able to play, play chords that could accompany us in our songwriting or in our trying to mimic other songs. Mm -hmm. Now, I, we, we could literally actually play music. I wanted to be able to strum chords, sing, and have somebody harmonize with me. Or, that was the whole thing. And so I learned this. Once uh, this kid had shown me some chords, I really figured, this, that's it. I've got it. This is all I really needed. This is all I ever wanted. And that went on for a few years, probably two or three years. Now, was and, this with uh, the same original guitar? I think it was. I believe mm -hmm. so. Uh, I believe it was, and my my sister, who is 
considerably older than me. She's seven years older than me. She eventually, she had a boyfriend who did play guitar. And I will admit this, he gave me an electric guitar uh, probably around the age of 11 or 12. Wow. And mm. that was amazing to me. That's, was, that's a big deal. That was huge yeah. uh, it, it, on every level. It was just, you know, the way it sounded, the way it looked. It was, you know, it was the coolest thing in the world to me <laughs> to, to have an electric guitar. Um, and I'm, I'm trying not to give you all the details. I'm actually skipping over a lot of stuff. But I just want to give you a paint a little picture. Sure. So the kid that uh, the, the foster kid came back, you know, he left. He came back to visit about a year at, later. And I said to, you know, in typical enthusiastic tween fashion, I said, let's go play guitar. Let's go jam. So we did. We get together and we went upstairs to my bedroom probably and we started uh, jamming on acoustic guitars. And I had my electric now, so I was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he, I remember this, he said, can I play your electric for a second? I said, sure. We're playing. He's playing the electric guitar. I'm playing the acoustic guitar. And he did something that changed my life. I'll never forget these. He took a note, a single note on the electric guitar and he bent it up like a half step or something. Wow. And I stopped and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa what was that? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> and uh, he said, I, do, I bent this note. You know, people do that with guitars. I don't know if you know that or not. And I'm like, wow, that's the coolest thing. <laughs> I I've do ever now. Seen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so literally like six months of just bending notes on the guitar and I'm driving people crazy and inadvertently sort of stumbled across the pentatonic scale um, and, and just knew that I really didn't know what it was. I just knew that it was a, it was a perfect tool for improvising. Like mm -hmm. I could hear a song, find the appropriate pentatonic scale and, and then start improvising over it. Yeah, it's kind but of I didn't really know it, what yeah. key it was or how I was, how I knew that these were the right notes, but I did know they were the right notes. And, uh, that's really where lead guitar started for me. Then I sort of started to notice that lead guitar was a thing. Like people actually do this. People play lead guitar. It's, it's in fact, it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. I, I can't believe I, I never noticed that before. Wow. And suddenly it's like, wow, Led Zeppelin, they have a lot of this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I started learning uh, Jimmy Page solos and Jimmy Page parts. And, and wow. what was really interesting is that it came relatively easy and you have to remember that for me at the time you know jimmy page was he was the king of rock guitar he was the guy mm -hmm. he was you know this was before van halen and he was sort of like you know he this is the best rock guitarist on, on the planet and here i am sort of being able to mimic what he does and it's actually not all that difficult for me and i'm thinking well if he's the greatest there is you know i'm certainly probably top three because I can do the same thing he does. <laughs> and so I didn't really need to practice much. I could, I could, uh, I could simulate a lot of that. And it really wasn't until I heard Van Halen for the first time. And at this point I probably would have been mid teens that, uh, I finally heard something that didn't make any sense to me. I was like, mm. what, what is he doing exactly? <laughs> And that's that not, became that's a new not mystery. just bending. <laughs> yeah, that's not just bending. <laughs> There's something else going on there. And you know, there was a big there was a big thing, I remember this, that nobody knew. This was before the internet, obviously, before you know, MTV even. It was before sure. a lot of the sort of uh, technological advancement multimedia things that we all take for granted today. So we really didn't know what he was doing. Uh, there was rumors, I remember, that he's using the right hand on the fretboard. And what I thought that meant was that he's he's using a classical guitar technique that involves, you know, playing a chord on the upper three strings and then arpeggiating the chords. That's what, whenever mm -hmm. I heard him doing his tapping thing, I, I figured that's what he's really doing. It's a finger picking. It's a fast finger picking thing. He's actually a classical guitarist <laughs> who's applied some of these techniques to Interesting. rock. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And... Not only that, but some of the tablature or music notation that was in books back then in like these little local music stores had it written that way because it was just assumed. Nobody knew anything about tapping. It just wasn't wow. known. It was really weird. <laughs> yeah. You know, wow. there, there was other rumors that there was like a, a special type of keyboard. Yes. That they were in and, you know, just crazy. It was like, uh, you know, the, just like this, uh, this uh, urban legend. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, yeah. He, and he did remember he would do a lot of stuff where he turned his back. Oh, to the that's audience. why he turned around a lot. Yeah. 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 So I actually, I took classical guitar lessons for a summer from this guy who was a really good player. When I think back, he was probably a guy in his mid to late twenties, but had trained classically and also was in the rock. So these lessons were kind of interesting because he really loved me because I was so enthusiastic. I loved the guitar so much. And it would always just be, it was a half hour lesson. It would be like 25 minutes of talking about the coolest things in rock and roll. And, and then the last five minutes, he'd be like, oh, yeah, and go through page 14 and 15. I'll see you next time. <laughs> but he could play uh, the sort of end of eruption or the end of Spanish fly, the, the, you know, the, where it yeah. really just epitomizes that technique. Mm-hmm. He could play those parts in the classical fashion and he could do it at that speed and everything. Wow. And I knew, and it was really impressive. However, I could also tell that something wasn't quite sounding the same. You know, it, it was the same notes and mm-hmm. it sounds really impressive. So it sounds like know. you had a very quick and accurate left hand as well. Right. You know, for yeah. doing that. I mean, grabbing all those chord positions and doing the finger picking that quickly oh, to try right. to emulate, uh, uh, you know, Van Halen thing. Wow. Yeah. 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 He was, it was really, yeah, he was a very good player. Uh, anyway, finally, a, a bunch of me, me and a bunch of my friends went to see Van Halen at Nassau Coliseum. Ah. And uh, I was only, I wasn't actually even a big, a huge fan of the band at that, at that point. I was really just a fan. I really was just mystified by the by some of the guitar playing. I had to see what he was doing. I went to the show. I brought my binoculars, and within the first five minutes of the show, I was like, "Oh, that's what that is." You know, I couldn't wait to get home because I, like, <laughs> I, I was like, "I know what he's doing now. I know the mystery." I was uh-huh. the first kid on the block, that, you know. So, I was the guy in my little rural small town. Um, I was the first guy that really had sort of unlocked the mystery. Of Van Halen, and once uh, you know, my my friends dropped me off at the house at like three o'clock in the morning after the show. I ran upstairs, grabbed my electric guitar, and played the outro to Eruption uh, almost immediately. Wow! Mm. Yeah, it was a life changing thing. And then, however excited I was about guitar prior to that, it had just magnified. You know, it had wow. just uh, it was ten times that now. Mm-hmm. I, I I was completely. Uh, engulfed in it. I couldn't wait to have the guitar. It was my, it was my uh, video game of the, you know, I, it was the equivalent to, you know, Quake 4 or, or whatever <laughs> kids are playing these days. Yes, I mean, you, you were there right at the time where somebody was actually doing, uh, he wasn't the first, of course, but somebody was actually doing something new and exciting mm-hmm. with the yes. guitar. And it's like, wow, this is way different than all the guitar that came before it. Yes. You know, not that it was bad, but it was just, different you know sure it really was it, it, i was right at that time and, and it had there are some things about that that were really great for me and some things that probably weren't great my perspective was really interesting because i remember this very clearly i you know once i get excited about something i can sort of absorb it pretty well and so i'm, I'm starting to learn i'm starting to crack the van halen code i'm getting to learn a lot of his songs i know how to play this i know how to play that i know the techniques I'm starting to get this, and at the, at the same time, people are like, "Well, you know, uh, you should listen to Hendrix. You should listen to Jeff Beck." And mm-hmm. I would listen to Hendrix, and I would listen to Jeff Beck, and I think, "What's the big deal about these guys? These, <laughs> this is easy. Why are these guys?" I had missed the point. You know what I mean? So it wasn't really until I got much older. When I say much older, it wasn't until I was like in my late twenties that the whole Hendrix thing hit me suddenly. Mm. And suddenly all these songs that I'd heard a million times, I heard them, suddenly I heard them differently because I had missed the point. You know what I mean? Mm, I, yeah, yeah. In, in my mind, I just thought, well, Eddie does that stuff and then some. So why is everybody, who cares what H- Hendrix is? Why, what's the big deal? I didn't really hear him. Um, but once I heard it, I just, I do remember also thinking, how did I miss this? When it was right in front of me all these years, how mm. could I have missed this is a monument this is you might know, this may be more monumental and more sort of fundamentally monumental than right. than the van halen stuff so um that's really where it all started and you know after high school uh, i immediately put a band together and we immediately started playing out in clubs in fact we started i put a band together with my brother 
and uh, we actually had to lie about our age to get into clubs. So we, you know, we had these fake IDs that made us older mm -hmm. than we actually were because my brother was still in school and we were gigging and we just, we started gigging immediately and just pretty much played all the way up until I, I finally submitted uh, a demo to Mike Varney in 1988. Wow. wow. You know, and the, those were the good old days, you know, and, and I, you know, I know what it was like up in, in Jersey where, where you were as well, but pretty much, you know, any, decent sized state that has you know some happening towns sure. there were places to play yeah. you know yes Lots of places. And, and they were they had music at least six nights a week yeah you know yeah. And you could you, you could you could get hired into a place for for three nights in a row you know and mm -hmm. do a small little residency or something and there was always some place to play you know you know what's crazy and i've had i've seen this now you know because you know i go out and i'll see a band play or whatever but i've been in some of the smaller places and I'm amazed that the band is almost not even audible because mm -hmm. the people are just talking. It's like everybody is oblivious to these guys busting their asses. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, hello, you know, these guys are working like nobody's business and, and nobody's. I mean, sometimes you, know, you do get hired and generally not a band quote unquote per se, but uh, you know, a, a solo or a duo or something like that. Sometimes yeah, that, you do get hired to be wallpaper yeah, and yeah. you got to know that going in. Yeah. But I mean, I've seen some, I've seen some, you True. know, the local bands and they're just getting, they're just literally like, I'm like, these guys are really good. Anybody right, want right, to watch? Right. You know, <laughs> so it that, is a different you, world. You, it is. You really see that here in Vegas. You really see that where, uh, you know, almost every, not everyone, but a lot of the hotel, lobbies like the main casino area will have a band playing yeah and it's usually a cover band mm -hmm. but it's usually a band that's really good and they're but again it just because they just disappear into background music oh. no one's really paying attention to the fact that hey the keyboard player just played that solo exact and no one's even <laughs> you know that yeah. singer's got a great voice and yeah. no one's actually noticing this so and, and and the thing is most of those bands are like they're they're full-time musicians that's their gig that's how they make their money mm -hmm. and they're probably pretty good musicians you know yeah. of course and nobody yeah. pays attention to them yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's it's so thing. so when you first put the band together i mean were you doing a lot of van halen or at that point did you actually had you already passed the point of of finding Hendrix and appreciating him and doing the Zeppelin stuff that you grew up on. What kind of material were you doing? What was your rig? Do you remember what the rig was? My rig was an old PV mace head. It was a combo amp. It was a solid state amp mm -hmm. with uh, two 12 inch speakers in, in it, I believe. Um, probably one of the worst sounding amps on the planet, but <laughs> <laughs> it had distortion. Two in a row. <laughs> this is 200 views in a row. That's great. I love that. That's perfect. But those things were ubiquitous. They were everywhere. It's another PV that was everywhere. The Mace and the Deuce. Yeah. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, what was the other one? Uh, the Bandit. Oh, the, ban yeah, the Bandit, bandit combo. Thing. Yeah. That yeah, was like the, 90 watts. Yeah. And it was just a harsh. It yeah. was even horrible for a green room amp. You the, know. <laughs> the Deuce. Remember the Deuce? The Mace and the Deuce. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's Absolutely. right. I'm sorry. Yeah, you said that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and I was always the guy. There was a club called the Shady Lane that we played at. That was always uh, it. It was a big room with a big stage, and they'd usually have two or three drum sets set up at one time. So oh, wow. oh. Uh, bands, they'd have like six or seven or eight bands go on stage that at at night. And they'd usually have a headliner that was like the big local, you know, whoever the big band locally was. Mm -hmm. but we couldn't wait to get in there because we just couldn't wait to prove ourselves and. To answer your original question, yes, everything that we did was guitar-oriented music. So we were doing Ozzy Osbourne, Van Halen, you know, uh, uh, Judas Priest, you know, anything that was popular but pretty much exclusively guitar-oriented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially stuff that had ripping solos in it, because I, I, you know, I couldn't wait to, <laughs> to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> we we got a reputation quick as as like the band that that could do Van Halen and could do these songs. And uh, and we were all very young, you know. We were practically in our teens, and uh, so we we did get get a reputation quickly. And we had a different crowd than most other bands because of the fact that we weren't we weren't sticking to the sort of status quo, the format that most of the booking agents wanted, which was that you you know you do the top forty songs, yeah. and you <laughs> you know, and at some point, you know, either the keyboard player or the bass player sings four or five of the songs and you know it, it, the popular bands in, in my area at that time were all they were all good but they were all the same 
yeah. they all were the same band. Mm -hmm. I mean, the same set list, the same sound, the same thing. We were kind of the rebels. And in a certain way, it worked against us because we have a lot of people that would show up to see us all the time. But it was always more like a concert because we were always performing like a concert. Mm -hmm. So we weren't doing songs just because they were on the radio. We were doing songs because we loved them and we were passionate about them. And we were our whole on stage demeanor was like the real band. So my brother's doing high kicks and flying around like David Lee Roth. And I'm pretending to, you know, we're jumping around. We're, we're, we're really sure. bringing it. And the good thing about this is that, you know, we got a, a great reputation. The bad thing about this is that uh, club owners would often complain that nobody's buying drinks because everyone's up. First of all, we weren't allowed to play in, in a lot of the overage clubs. So we were doing a lot of underage clubs, but even in the underage clubs, you know, people buy drinks, yeah. they buy sodas. But nobody was buying stuff usually when they saw us because they're all jammed up to the stage. They wanted to see it. It was a, it was much more like a concert when we would perform. That's right. cool. Man. And and, and yes, yeah, that's very cool. And, <laughs> and the club owner side of that, and which you know reflects back to the booking agent. Well, he hears about it because you know nobody's dancing. If you're not dancing, you're not sweating. If you're not sweating, you're not drinking. Yeah, that's right. You they're know? just up there rocking. Right, they're just up there rocking. Yeah, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> What's wrong with these yeah. people? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But that was that, and and so you had also asked, I think, about had I had I hit that maturity point yet, where suddenly the, the Steve Ray Vaughns and, and you know, or, or actually the Hendrixes mm -hmm. and the the Albert Co Kings and Albert Collinses of the world started to make sense to me. I hadn't reached that point yet, actually. So it was still Van Halen, Randy Rhodes, uh, George Lynch, Warren D. Martini. These were my first sort of the influences that were these were the guys that really motivated me not to play. bad influences if you can cop them on stage you know i mean that's yeah. that's uh that's pretty good playing at an early age man wow and yeah then, it, it was cool <laughs> it, it wow was. yeah that's uh that's yeah, that's a that's, that's, a that's runner an arsenal to yeah yeah for <laughs> sure <laughs> that's very and to, cool yeah for for me because uh, you know like most kids the guitar with you know a guitar ability in my mind, was was pretty much measured by how much technique you had, how, how much speed you had, how much technique you had. Mm -hmm. The more technique and speed you had, the better player you were. And as you know, ob that's obviously a very immature criteria, <laughs> but it was sort of what I was. I, I was. I fell into that typical category. We see it on YouTube all the time, where some guy oh, yeah. is ripping uh, on the fretboard, but there's really almost zero musicality. Uh, you mean where the, the fastest guitar player, like the fastest picker or something? I've seen those videos and I go, this guy has probably spent countless hours right. playing 32 <laughs> notes a second right. to never use this again. <laughs> right. Now, now, if you could just play a song. <laughs> yeah. Now, if there was something musical about if there was if there was yeah. if it had something to do with music, that would be cool. Oh my god. Uh, well, and a, he looks a, like he's hemorrhaging. A, a, <laughs> a, a friend of mine had the best line. He he was at some <laughs> some jam fest and it, it's I, I only want to get into details because yes. you, you know where I was talking about. Okay. And he just looks at, at the other his the friend that he's with probably fifteen minutes or thirty minutes or maybe two hours into this. I don't know. Yeah. And he just looks at the guy, he goes a hundred dollars for a melody. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that, that was like that was like Howard Lease. Howard Lease was standing beside me at the at the PRS experience, and he goes, "I think some of these guys are getting paid by the note." Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was the guy that would often get accused of, you know, speed with no with no substance and and, oh. and and for me i didn't really care because i just in my mind i just thought the only people that are criticizing me are the people who aren't capable of doing what i'm doing and they're just jealous and in many cases that was likely the case but sure um i really had a, a i got my record deal in 1988 i literally just submitted a tape to mike varney's spotlight column ah. our band our band had gone on to try to do all kinds of things we we did demos. We we showcased for record labels. You know, we wanted to get a record deal, and mm -hmm. so we were writing and learning about the recording experience and submitting our our demos to all the labels and eventually getting some interest. And but nothing ever really caught on. And really, out of almost a desperation kind of feeling, uh, sending a tape to Mike Varney was really just another thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't. Uh, 
and I really didn't expect to get selected because uh, at that point, Ingve Malmsteen had come out, and Ingve was, you know, from a technique place, had taken it to a whole nother level, and I was really just starting to get a grasp on that, and I was starting to be able to simulate some of his stuff. I di- I didn't know that. I never had known prior to Ingve that it was possible to pick every note that fast. <laughs> and I'd also never heard of an arpeggio before him, so yeah. that that was a brand new thing. So I was starting to get a feel for that, and I thought it really doesn't get any better than this. You really can't advance more than this. Mm. So if I can continue down this road and start getting a grip on this Ingve stuff, you know, <laughs> I will have mastered the guitar. That's as far as it goes. Now, well, um, uh, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. You- you said you got you got picked from the Mike Varney spotlight thing, right? I did get picked, yes. Because you yeah. know you're you're in a you're in a very small group of guys. I mean, that's where Jason Becker and Marty Friedman and mm-hmm. oh know, yeah, there, there wasn't. Paul Gilbert. That's not a huge roster. That's no, like especially a, at that time. No, that's why I didn't. Once I got once, so what happened was I I, I didn't I you know. Re, the spotlight column was a column you could read. You couldn't hear these guys. You could just yeah. read an article, mm-hmm. a exactly. small little article that would describe so and so from Australia. Yep. He'd pick one. He'd pick three guys. You didn't hear them, but you kind of would sort of use your imagination based on the description that Mike would give of them. Sure. And like you said, every now and then, if Mike had discovered someone that, that he thought was super exceptional, he would assign them to his his small label called Shrapnel. Yes. And um, so what I did is I sent a tape, and I also just to be thorough the way I, I was uh i i figured i'll send one to the po box that he suggests i'm i'm guessing he gets thousands of tapes he'll probably not get to mine in months if he gets to it at all so just for the heck of it i'm also going to send a demo to guitar player magazine fedex and someone will have to sign for it and th- this tape will end up in someone's hands it, it, it has to oh, that's smart that was a smart move, man. It was actually because I got a phone call the very next day. I sent it overnight. I got a phone call from Mike Varney the very next day. Oh, wow. And um, I couldn't believe it because honestly, is even though I had the reputation and locally as sort of the hotshot guitarist, I also in the back of my mind knew that there were, this was a small town. You know, being a big fish in a small town is not that big of a deal. There's probably guys all over the place that are just doing incredible things on the guitar that I haven't even heard. Which was true, <laughs> because yeah, it, like I just heard Ingve. Uh, you know, right, I got a lot of learning to do. <laughs> right. And then he, you know, Mike gets on the phone with me, and he's excited, and he says, you know, would you be interested in signing with me? And I, of course, I was just, I couldn't believe it. Wow. I just couldn't believe, for on a number of levels, I couldn't believe that I was being considered as part of that. You know that that I he would even hear me as part of that league. And I also was excited that this is an actual record deal. This is what we've been trying to get for six years. So mm-hmm. uh, this is all very exciting. And then, of course, he turns me on to his other players because I'd never written an instrumental song in my entire life. I had no idea how that worked. As, as a matter of fact, the demo I'd sent him was, I think, three songs. And they weren't really songs. They were just just some chord backing stuff, just mm-hmm. like backing tracks with me blowing over it. So mm-hmm. they weren't really songs. And, but, and they said, weren't your whole band either. And it wasn't the whole band. It was some four track, you know, demo thing. And that's when Mike said, okay, well, I like your playing. You need to learn how to write songs. Uh, Have you ever written an instrumental song? No, I have no idea how to do that. And then he's like, all right, well, pick out, go check out this guy. This guy's name is Vinny Moore. Check out this guy. His name is Tony McAlpine. Check out this guy, Paul Gilbert. So suddenly he turns me on to these, these guitar players that are just unbelievable, you know, from a technique place. And I just, they were doing things that I just didn't think were possible on the guitar. I thought I'd heard it all and I just, it started to, started to click now. This doesn't end, does it? This just keeps getting. Wow. (laughs) This doesn't end. There's Uh, more guys. There's more guys, yeah. I'm going to need longer strings. (laughs) Or more of them. (laughs) Or more of them, right? Yeah, yeah. now they, now they go sideways. They don't go longer. Exactly. (laughs) exactly (laughs) yeah wow i got when i so i started my demo thing and i was writing quickly i you know we finally and the other thing that was cool about mike varney is he really had a great sense of you know he had done he had signed a few guys he had discovered ingray mountain he you know he signed tony mcalpine vinnie moore paul gilbert Mm. and who are all amazing players 
but the one thing they had in common is that they were they were all sort of coming from the neoclassical mm -hmm. uh, yes. genre. Yep. That was their thing. And I my first song that I sent to Mike Varney had that feel to it, and he called me and said, "No, we have enough of that. We have enough guys doing this. I can ah. hear in your playing mm -hmm. that you're really not that that guy. Um, you know, try to come up with material that's more." your own influences you know what what would van halen do if he was doing an instrumental album what would that sound like and i thought interesting ah, yeah wow. let's do that and so that was really the beginning of my first album very insightful of him you know it, it's, yeah yeah and that yeah. was that that was the thing that turned me on to greg was i was like this is not the neoclassical thing mm -hmm. yeah there's something it, different here it, yeah. there was like this formula of all the instrumental guys Mm -hmm. And they did it very well. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. Tony McAlpine was, you know, it's just amazing, you mm -hmm. know, but it was like, it was kind of that same form. Mm -hmm. Right. And then Greg had this thing and I was like, man, this is like really cool, almost like fusion-y, but it's right. still rocking, mm -hmm. you know? And I was like, I can listen to this, Cool. <laughs> you know? And that's yeah, the way it yeah. was. Yeah. Yeah. It was coming more from a, you know, the, the, probably maybe the Dixie Dregs would have been the closest thing to... Yeah. It, it was sort of a blue, sophisticated bluesy thing. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, there's a band. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there was, it's incredible. Um, but it was great. So, you know, we finally came up with the songs. He flew, he flies me out to California. I'm finally going to record. He picks, Mike Vardy picks me up at the airport. Uh, and I, I, I'm not telling this to go play by play. I just, what happened in, in the, what I'm about to say was also a big, sort of monumental moment for me he picks me up at the airport in san francisco and uh we're driving around he's showing me around san francisco and the studio was located about an hour outside of san francisco and so he we're just we're just getting to know each other and he's got a cassette tape in his car that's playing the whole time that we're we're kind of talking at a low volume i hear some of the most outrageous guitar playing i've ever heard in my life it's like everything i just heard on steroids and I'm thinking wow. what and finally about a half hour into the ride I said Mike what is that music who is that he's like well that's Jason Becker there you go oh. Marty Friedman they're 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 uh, they've got this thing called cacophony, cacophony. <laughs> yeah and, and I said what is that is that you know <laughs> really I, I mean it was outrageous yeah yeah, yeah. and still is by the way it still is yeah. even today yeah and he, and he says oh yeah it's, uh, well, you know, these guys are going to be at the studio while you're recording, so you'll get it. And I'm like, no, they're not. He's like, yeah. Turn around. <laughs> going home. That's, that's exactly what Can I felt. I get like the red saying. eye back? I was like, I was, you know, at this point, I'm probably 24, wow. 25, 24, 25 years old. Mm. But Jason was like 18 or something. Yeah, yeah. He was a I mean, literally a teenager yep. playing stuff that was... Uh, yeah, you know, at that point, I just stuff that I'd never heard before that didn't think was possible. I couldn't even envision some of it. Mm. And here he is telling me this guy's going to be there, and I was so, I just yeah, like you said, I was just like, I want to, I want to take my toys and go home. I don't. Wanna. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it was such an amazing experience because Jason was such a cool guy. He was so, and this is the case I noticed with all great musicians. They're all. The best ones are always humble. They're always cool because they're, they think of what they're doing as a, they're, they're grateful for their own abilities and mm -hmm. they're, they're looking for opportunities to just share it. They're not competing. They're not out there. It's a different mindset. They're not insecure about what they're doing. They already know that what they're doing is cool. And so the goal is not to prove it. The goal is to share it. Yeah. And so usually the guys that are really good are, are very cool. I would, and Jason, I, would, I would think that you would get off of track if you were just focusing on like, I'm going to show everybody, yeah. you know, this, that's how, true. how badass I yeah, am. I, you know, I, I think like, a lot of the competition does come from insecurities, you know, it, it does. Sure. Yeah. You just got to feel good about your, what you do, you know, that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. And then it conveys, right. Right. You know, right, it's exactly. the other thing. I mean, you listen to that stuff and you go, you, you think first, you go, oh my God, how is anybody doing this? Right. But then when you see him perform it, you're like, that guy couldn't be any happier right now. Right. You know, right. like he's doing the absolute thing he loves. Right. Yes. <laughs> and that's really what resonates. That's really one of the most important things that any of us have said tonight. That's the real issue 
with a great performance. When you see those clips of Steve Ray Vaughan on stage and the sweat's pouring off his face and he's just manhandling that guitar and he's so in it, he's so connected to oh, it. Yeah. What's really impressive about the performance is that you can see how aligned with himself he really is, how in a perfect place he really is. That's really what we're applauding. We're watching someone, we're celebrating someone's uh, passionate connection to what they're what they're doing. That's what we are getting off on. Right. And that's sure. why that's why a lot of musicians who might have a lot of technique or have even a lot of knowledge harmony wise or might just who might be very good from an academic place mm -hmm. if they're not in it if they're not feeling it and that you see them on stage and they sort of look almost unhappy having to do this <laughs> they look you know they look Mechanical. nervous or they look uh like this is a challenge or it looks it looks uncomfortable um it affects us because psychologically i think we start thinking do you even like what you're doing right now you don't <laughs> seem very excited right yeah like, wh this... wh where's the emotion where's the yeah. emotion right yeah. you know it's funny is is that now if you watch a video of paul gilbert now right because he's got short hair mm -hmm. he'll even say he'll go when you do this a you got to make this face <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know and that guy right. wears every note now yeah you know oh, yeah. And, yeah. and and you can just tell that that's i mean it's and, his life. And, and I mean, <laughs> yes. it, it doesn't matter what style you play in. No. You, know, you really have to enjoy what you do. And, and it's, it's not a show. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm reading the book of someone who I've always been a huge fan of, uh, Santana, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. the same way. He's just, oh my God. he's just so, he becomes part of it, you know, yeah. and he's a very spiritual guy. And he, he gets really in the tries, wood. He really, <laughs> yes, he really tries to impart what he's feeling. Sure. You know, to the, yes. to the masses, you know, yeah. and it's, I, I, and don't care feel it. I don't care if it's one note. That's when it's freaking good. Oh, yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, exactly. The, the, what you're talking about now um, hit me in an instant at a NAMM show when I saw Robin Ford. Uh -huh. This was this was a monument. Another, you know, I'm, I'm, I keep remembering these landmark moments of my development. Um, I had just gotten my deal with Fender Guitars. This was um, first album. The heavy metal strat, right? The HM Strat, yeah, everything came together. The stars aligned for that first album because we got Billy Sheehan on, on bass. Uh, Mike was able to get Fender to come up, and and uh, I became sort of the catalyst for their late in the game HM Strat that was their their version of the sort of uh, offset double cutaway yep. mm -hmm. with a humbucker, uh, you know, post Van Halen guitar. They, these guys held out for everybody else was doing it you remember kramer was doing it sure. charvel all yeah, the everybody right. else e even gibson even gibson, even gibson had gibson. a double cutaway <laughs> right <laughs> these guys kind of waited till last minute and but they came up with this guitar which was actually a very cool guitar and uh so i had all these full page ads running and uh, from fender and we had the billy sheehan thing and we had uh you know the sort of shred but without the neoclassical yep. fresh Mm -hmm. approach and so everything kind of fell together with the album um and and plus i had learned so much from jason becker who was at the studio he was uh because he loved guitar so much anytime i had free time in between takes in the studio or after the sessions you know he was just like hey you want to jam hey let's jam hey wow. let's play he he just couldn't wait to play he just he was so in love with the guitar more so more, even more than i was and i was you know, I was infatuated with it, but he was just, uh, there was a, there was a, a, another level of passion that he had for music and the guitar that was, that yeah. really, uh, was reflected accurately in his, his ability. His abilities were, were way beyond anybody at, should be at that age. I mean, yeah. he had no, he had no right playing that. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is in that documentary, mm -hmm. his mom said that he went and bought a small travel guitar. So at red lights, he could play while he was that. driving. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's how he was. And, we and were he, in a hotel. He stayed, he came up to Prairie Sun studios, which was the studio uh, outside of San Francisco. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you where, but okay, cool. Yeah. It was in Katadi, uh, which is a small town. Yep. Um, you know, it's small, area outside of San Francisco but um, Jason I'd come back to the studio maybe for the second album or maybe to fix some some stuff on the first album I don't remember but I was there and Jason called me and said can I come up you know hang out can we jam and I said yeah sure so we ended up jamming out at the studio and playing till like two in the morning it got so late that he said uh, 
would it be cool if I crash at your hotel instead of driving all the way back to San Francisco tonight? And I, I was like, yeah, that's cool. So we had two beds in the hotel and I'm, I'm sort of done with the guitar. I'm just, you know, I'm like, all right, I love the guitar, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm jammed out. I'm going to kick back, find a movie and watch some TV. And, you know, I hear Jason unplugged, you know, still on, on his bed. <laughs> He's over there still playing. Right. So he starts playing. I never remember the name of the song. It's a classical song that I know Yngwie has done a bunch of times on the guitar. It's with the melody is. Dun, 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 yes. What's the name of that? Oh, okay. um, um, it's it's on um, uh, Rising Force. Yeah, uh, but it's a but it's a classical piece, yes. kind of a waltzy mm -hmm. classical. It's not green sleeves. Is it? No, no, no. no, no. It's, um, uh, okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll remember it. Yeah. We'll hunt it down, yeah. Right after we're done with the interview, we'll remember it. <laughs> Some Baroque era thing. But anyway, it's yeah. a classical piece, and it's not easy to play it because it's, you know, you're, you've got bass lines and melody lines happening. At the same. It's a classical, it's a classic, classical guitar piece. Mm -hmm. And I hear him playing this. On the, I'm not looking at him. I'm looking at the TV. I'm just sort of like, I'm just listening to him, and I hear him doing this flawlessly. It sounds perfect. And so in a sort of lazy manner, I kind of turn my head over to see, see what he's doing. He's playing that piece with his left hand on top of the guitar. Oh my God. So he had just <laughs> decided, I guess one day that it was too boring to just learn it perfectly. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. We're going to yeah. learn everything I, in reverse. Yeah, I, I just remember thinking to myself, <laughs> Dude, you're in timeout. Starting right now. <laughs> enough, enough of that. No but, more guitar for you. You know, like that other piece inside the inside the documentary. The, this one guy goes, so he's up on stage and he's doing this incredible piece while he's doing this yo-yo trick with the other hand. Yeah. And when he came off, he goes, "Man, I screwed up the yo-yo trick." He goes, "Because <laughs> what the hell is wrong with you? You just played the most incredible thing, and you're worried about the yo-yo trick." <laughs> <right>. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, wow. he was outrageous, and 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 the thing is so <laughs> humble. That was the crazy thing. I, because you know, I play with him sometimes and think to myself, how could there be any, how could there be any thrill in you playing with me? I can't. Or, <laughs> why, why are we? But he was always into it. No matter, I would do something that was, in my opinion, way easier than anything he's doing. But but if it sounded cool, he'd stop me and go, oh, what was that? What was that? You know, you could tell he was just a sponge for this. Yeah, he could not wow. wait. Yeah. to absorb any information now you recorded you recorded on that album after he was uh incapacitated right yes yes yes, yes. yeah i did that's so cool man it, was that uh i know i remember was that an album of his uh earlier work or was that his new composition that was that, a new composition. new compositions i thought so yeah, yeah. he still yeah. had the ability to they did, right. they did oh, something yeah. with his eyes right they were using a computer thing that he could move his eyes and and move the mouse right the, i think so i don't know it exactly i have to really yeah because now he has to do it he communicates with his dad and right. tells his dad where to, to put it up on the screen right but, um back this was right he still could kind of talk but it was really mm -hmm. it, they show it in a documentary but i had heard that you were called in because he wrote it on the computer but then he they got real musicians right yourself right. and some other people right. to come in and record it wow yeah he had Michael E. Firkins, I think, do yeah. help a lot. Um, uh, actually, he had a lot of guest guest appearance people on on the album. So, yeah, I, I if that's the album you're talking about, yes, yeah, I'm, sure. Yeah. I'm sure. And just yeah. a short period of time, if you really think about it. And I know, you know, we're talking about Jason Becker, but mm -hmm. that short period of time, the influence that he had over so many guys, yeah, absolutely, that true. were doing what, what Greg was doing. Mm -hmm. It was just like he left that mark, and it's still there. Yeah. It's still there, and he really actually never got started. I mean, he was just starting yeah. to get started. He the was band, just... the David Lee Roth thing, he got signed, yeah. and they were like, yeah, man, mm -hmm. this is awesome. He's going to tour the world. He's going to do what he wants, and he could. Yeah, so but sad. everything prior to that, yeah. and even that, you could put in the categories as you know, appetizers. We hadn't even seen the main thing yet, so just the appetizers are, are still lingering as that impactful over these. Sure. You know, wow. He never really even got a chance to to get started, you know? Yeah. So yeah, just unbelievable. The, what I was going to say earlier was that during that time frame, I went to a NAMM show and, uh, I was with at the Fender booth 
So it was kind of fun to watch some of their great artists, one of which was um, Robin Ford. Mm -hmm. And Robin Ford was performing with a guitarist by the name of Don Don Mock. Have you ever heard of him? No, I haven't. No. No. Don Mock was a sort of, yeah, he's sort of one of the best unknown guitar players probably that there are. He's, I think he was teaching at GI, uh, GIT and, um, and uh, maybe doing some seminars, but sort of a, a very well-rounded uh, very academic player, very, very mm. seasoned academic player, you know, very good at blues and jazz and that sort of mix between the two and very good at explaining music theory concepts and harmony concepts. Um, very good player. He had an instructional video that I had gotten from REH that I was, I remember I learned a lot from and he was, he wasn't maybe a super, he wasn't a high speed player or anything, but just a very good player, super tasty, mm. very, um, you know, just real tasty player. Sure. And so he's performing with Robin Ford at the Fender booth. <clears throat> and I, and I, I was just starting to get into, I was just starting to become a Robin Ford fan. I was just starting to get these more mature influences. Finally, I was starting to really venture into other territory that wasn't just about guys that was fast. Mm -hmm. And so Robin Ford was one of my favorite guys. And I do remember thinking I, when I walked in, um, Don Mock was actually taking a solo. It was just the two of them playing. There wasn't even a band. It was just the two of them. Don Mock was playing a solo, and Robin Ford was sort of accompanying him with rhythm guitar. He was comping. Mm -hmm. And Don Mock played this amazing solo, really sophisticated, tasty, really cool solo. And he gets done playing, got a big round of applause. And I remember thinking, how's Robin Ford going to top that? <laughs> oh, man, how's he going to top that? It was wow. a perfect solo. So Robin Ford, uh, you know, the, the audience dies down a little bit, the clapping stops. Robin Ford's turn. He 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 plays like three notes with this opening lick, and the the hair on my arms literally stood up. It was the first. <laughs> it, it, it was the first time that that whole thing that people had always said to me. If you, so, you know, try to say less with more. You know, I used to I, I used to roll my eyes when I'd hear people say that. I'd be like, ah, oh, <laughs> stop with your stupid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just because you can't play as fast as I, right, right, <laughs> yeah. And then suddenly, it really made sense. It was the first time that I was like, "Oh man, now I get it." So, you really can uh, knock people over that that way. You that can really be done. I mean, mm -hmm. I just saw it. I just experienced it. In fact, I had a reputation already because my album was out. I remember being a little self conscious because I was so affected by what he was playing that I could feel people watching me watch him. And mm -hmm. then I was kind of wondering if people are recognizing how emotional this feels to me mm. and uh, being a little bit weirded out by that. But, uh, but that was another landmark uh, moment for me where, where that suddenly made sense. And that's really stuck with me after that. Um, it, it seems so I mean, I think subconsciously, I, I obviously had to have understood some of that already, but I didn't, it's hard to put it in the words. I just remember that it, it just clicked for me finally, mm -hmm. that yeah. being the fastest guy in the world and playing some three octave arpeggio <laughs> tapping thing really isn't the, that really no longer is the measurement as to whether or not someone is a good player. In fact, sometimes I think that all of that technique can be a little bit of a impediment on advancement, on true musical advancement. Because if someone's constantly wrapping themselves around the idea of more technique, it, it usually means they're not focusing on much on much else. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, when introspection, when it was time for introspection, because you know I, we did a couple of albums with my my vocal band called How To. Yep. My original contract had me with two albums for my band, my vocal band, and two albums instrumental. So the very first album I did was Greg Howe. The second two albums I did was the band. And then my fourth album for the original contract was my second instrumental album, which was Introspection. Mm -hmm. And by the time Introspection came along, I'd really elevated myself. Um, I had really grown up, so to speak. And I do remember thinking... I do want to push the envelope with this album, but I don't want to push the envelope in terms of technique because that's a redundant and and fairly 
superficial quest. You know, I, I'd rather push my push my own envelope of creativity and musicality and and see where that goes. And one of the things that I started to discover about myself around that time was that I loved a lot of fusion and jazz music. And I loved the technique that came with rock like Ingve. I, I didn't care for Ingve's music really, but I liked his technique. Mm -hmm. um, I liked a lot of jazz music. I was listening to a lot of Larry Carlton and even like John Schofield and you know Yellow Jackets and, and you know just all kinds oh, of yeah. and tribal tech a little bit. Oh yeah, I love all of that. Yeah, I was I was starting to really get into that. But I always wondered, how come the, the, nobody shreds in this world? I, you know, you don't hear, why doesn't John Schofield take those same sophisticated lines and, 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 and turn them up to, you know, <laughs> and put the gas pedal down? Right, like, right. You know, I just never heard that. So I was kind of motivated in my own mind to sort of combine all these influences that I had, which was from everywhere. I mean, at this point, I had been influenced by literally everything. <laughs> Sounds like. Yeah. And I just wanted to see what would happen if I wrote an album based on having the freedom to incorporate all that stuff. Because my first album, I was almost directed by Mike Varney to make sure that it stays in a sort of aggressive rock format because his label was really kind of a heavy metal mm -hmm. label at that point. It wouldn't have made sense. Introspection would not have made sense in 1988. So, but Mike Varney had evolved also by the time introspection came around which is i think 93 or 94 and so and also i got the a, the chance to record that album at home that was the first album that i didn't record uh at prairie sun studio so we had worked out a deal where i had some recording gear as part of my payment hmm. and i got to record the introspection album at home so that was a great that was a great situation nice. I, I cool. could really be creative I could really I wasn't under the clock I wasn't you know somebody looking at their watch going come on let's finish up mm -hmm. I could really relax and take my time and make sure the music was exactly what I wanted it to be and that's uh, a very nice luxury I mean most people have was. that today if you want to record at home there's yeah. a plethora of ways to do it but back then uh, there was a whole lot less technology and to be exactly. afforded that that luxury that's exactly. awesome yeah it was awesome it was awesome um it's awesome. It's it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, when you have the freedom to really make things be exactly how you want them to be, you have to be careful not to start back painting yourself into a corner where it's like, what did I just write here? Can I actually perform this live? <laughs> I, oh, wow. I, it's, it's one thing to have the freedom to, to have developed this part over the last four days and then, you know, anything that I had trouble with, I can punch in and make sure that it, it's executed correctly. But... Have I ever really stopped to see if, <laughs> <laughs> if this is doable? I mean, right. you know, for the most part it is, but there were a couple of moments on that album where it's like, I almost felt a little guilty because I, you know, I hear something in my head and I need to record it, but then I have to ask myself, am I really capable of that? You know, mm -hmm. you know, so wow. uh, it, it becomes, it can, you know, creativity is, it's hard to monitor yeah, on, it's hard for me to sometimes, I, I guess with me, the thing that happens is that what I hear in my head is the most important thing about music. So when I write songs, they're almost never written with a guitar in my hands. They're usually written while I'm driving or I'm you oh, know, wow. walking or I, you know, I'm getting some out of the refrigerator. I hear ideas when I'm not around the guitar because I think the guitar neck tends to, it tends to show up in front of my face as a set of limitations. In other words, it, the guitar, if I write from the perspective of the guitar, it ends up sounding like guitar stuff. Mm -hmm. oh. And instead of sounding like, what would I create if I didn't have a guitar? What would be, what do I actually want to hear? So, so I think sometimes the guitar can uh, sort of limit our creative potential. Uh, no, I, 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 I yeah. believe that. I believe that. I, you know, I think that's why a lot of guys, they, they play guitar, but they write on a piano. You yes. Know, you know, yes. because it's, Same thing. It, you know, it, yeah. it makes you think differently musically or it forces you to sure do something physically different you know you joe know? satch said that uh and i call him joe satch like i know him right <laughs> um he said one time in, a, in an article that he carries around one of those little uh dictating machines you know that you would just speak into right, and right, then give right. to the secretary mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he would hum these melody lines that he would get yeah. in his head while he was driving down the road 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah I you don't know? doubt that. So, and they would go back and figure it out. Right. And I, was like, I would do the same thing. Oh, look I, at that. And <laughs> same exact thing. And, and, and to this day, the stuff that I write that I feel best about is never stuff that comes from the, as a result of having the, the guitar in my hands. It's always the result of hearing a melody in my head and just hearing something and then having to go to the guitar and find out where that's located on the, how, how, what does that look like on the mm -hmm. guitar? Cause that's cool. <laughs> yeah, it is cool. And it's, it's cool on the one hand, on the other hand, um, when you start hearing things that you may not be capable of playing, <laughs> I was then, just going to say, can I play this live? <laughs> <laughs> right. Then you have to, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of an ambiguous place to live because <laughs> should I record this? Cause I really, this is part of me. I mm -hmm. hear it. It's coming from my own creative source. But at the same time, if I can't really play this as as good as I wish I could, or as well as I think it deserves to be played, should I even record it? And but if I don't record it, aren't I being, uh, aren't I sort of you know not honoring my own creative? I you know what I mean? It's, yeah, it becomes oh, yeah, a little yeah. bit of a strange uh, inner conflict for me. <laughs> and, oh, and and this is also why some some of the techniques that I ended up sort of coming up with were the result of not being able to do things conventionally very well, you know, it's certain things very well. So a lot of, most of the, my guitar playing, I always tell people is the direct result of, you know, my style is as much of the result of my limitations as they are my strengths. Mm -hmm. You know, my weaknesses are just as, mu as much a part of my sound as my strengths. You know, mm -hmm. like I always wanted that ability to, when I would hear Alan Holdreth and I hear that like no peck attack and this keyboard like these keyboard like sounding runs, I mean, I couldn't really get that to happen on the guitar no matter how hard I tried. But if I once I discovered that I could actually play runs with two hands and I uh. had a lot and I had a lot of influence of two handed playing because of my Van Halen, you know, days. Mm -hmm, sure. But even by then, of course, even by my first album, you know, that had become a cliche. The Van Halen style tapping had become Oh, yeah. way overused yeah. so i wasn't doing that but i was tapping things but in a different way and uh almost all the time you know i don't know if you know the song um kick it all over but kick it all over is a melody it's a song that was on my first album it goes down so, so i'm like uh outlining the chords with these uh sort of six note per beat arpeggios and really difficult and i when i when i wrote the song i couldn't play it i literally couldn't play <laughs> wow. that wow i couldn't I, I was like i hear these notes i gotta but every time i try to do it it sounds really bad it sounds really sloppy and un you know i can't do it mm -hmm. so i discovered a way to do it with tapping and this was out of pure desperation just because somehow I've got, I'm not leaving this room until those notes come out of that speaker cabinet <laughs> somehow. Um, but it really offered a brand new approach to tapping that had more to do with, with the left hand leading as opposed to, the, you know, a lot of the Van Halen stuff was always the right hand is initiating things. Uh, wow, and this I was a, thought about it that way, but yeah, yeah. Wow. See, here's what would have been the difference between me and Greg. I would have picked up the phone and called Jason Becker and said, hey, uh, how do I play this? I got this thing that I can't do. It's probably been a, a much more uh, useful way of, I, I probably should have done that in retrospect. So I, I got, I got to get into a little bit of gear here, but you know, back in Good. the, um, of, with the, the heavy metal strat, yes. uh, what, what was your rig then? Was it, uh, was it a Fender amp? Was it a Marshall? What was it? The At that time, I was, yeah, what, Fender had a really great deal for me. They were really all in. So oh. I, I was playing their... Um, M80? No, it was the uh, the Dual Showman, the reissued Dual Showman oh. with the red knobs. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And they were, they're great amps. I mean, they were 100 watts and they were um, basically Fender twins without the, without being combos. Mm -hmm. So they, they had a lot of headroom. They had that bluesy thing that, that, that twang, that Fender twang, but at the same time, and I had a couple of them modified with this guy that was a Marshall freak. So I had uh, some of the albums that you hear on the 90s, like Parallax and, and the Five album. Um, they were played on one of these Dual Showman amps that was, I, I think, minorly modified in the front end. So they really had like this right down the middle, all that 
that uh, that immediacy and that upfrontness that Marshalls have and that the sort of British tone offers, mm -hmm. but along with the sort of smooth, twangy thing that cool. uh, the Fender inherently has. Mm -hmm. A really nice sound. I, I mean, the Parallax album is one of my favorite recorded guitar sounds ever. Um, I don't really know how I got it to come out like that because I've tried the same exact formula so many times and it just never quite sounded like that really? ever again. Wow. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's funny because my first album is probably the worst sounding guitar that's ever been recorded in the history of, <laughs> of recording. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Parallax album, I think, is my favorite guitar. You know, lead. You know, electric lead guitar sound. Nice. That possibly that I've ever heard. You know. Uh, wow. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something gonna here, and I listen. and I know that all the heavy metal fans are gonna kill me for this, <laughs> but I would say that Cowboys from Hell probably had that beat, because that was just the most transistory sounding. You know. <laughs> Dime, really? uh, dime bag almost didn't sound like it was just it's not a good i mean <laughs> it's good music don't get me wrong uh, but the amp sound just was so it was just tran it was like wow. somebody playing through a transistor radio mm -hmm. you know? well i would put my album up next to that I, I would <laughs> i'd like to enter myself into that conversation for worst recorded That's sound ever funny. <laughs> i'm gonna get death threats by the way well, for that. oh i'm sure i'm yeah. sure yeah <laughs> Well, you know, I'm 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 glad that it got better, you know, <laughs> markedly better. Yeah, it, it was. Well, you know, I really learned again. Growing up is a big. Growing up actually helps uh, get, help, helps make me more mature. Uh, <laughs> coincidentally, funny how I, that works. Know, I can remember again being a kid. I'd go into the music store. I'd go in there to look for some gear, and then I'd uh, inevitably plug into some solid state practice amp that's got loads of distortion, and then I'd. Mm -hmm. It tried to show off in front of everybody. I remember one day when I was, this is again, way before the record deal, this guy at the music store says, you sound pretty good, Greg. Why don't you plug into one of these Marshalls? And I, he plugs me into like an old JMP or something, some plexi thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where there's no distortion unless the thing is completely cranked. And yeah. I just remember hearing that sound and going, this is the scariest, most intimidating. Who would ever want to play through a Marshall? These are <laughs> loud. There's no distortion. It's it, it. You hear every mistake. They're mm -hmm. unforgiving. This is the scariest thing in the world. Is this really what these guys are playing through? But I realized as I started to mature that tone became much more important to me than, you know, what the amp is capable of doing in terms of distortion. I started to realize distortion is a pretty easy thing to get. Right, um, and it's an easy thing to hide behind. Yeah, and it's a very easy thing to hide behind. Yeah, um, if we're really going to try to make our music as good as possible, we have to start becoming a lot more conscious of tone, and that's going to probably mean that we've we've just got to learn the formula here, which is that the better it sounds, likely the tougher it is to be, to play. It's probably going to be tougher to play, uh, but it's going to be worth it. So it helps because it gets you become a better player because you realize I I can't just have this massive saturation that i can right. it makes you know i've got to i've got to have tone and it's unfortunately, 70 it's, db of gain <laughs> you know i've got to stop sucking so i can play one of these good amps <laughs> right right well i don't think you have to worry about that anymore no um and and speaking of good amps you've got some uh you got some new endorsements happening yeah man we do exciting stuff yeah, yeah. it's um it's really feeling uh, you know, it's it's a great thing. So I really feel blessed to be working with uh, DV Mark for one. They are uh, they're a great company. Mm -hmm. Really, they've they've mastered the the Mark. I don't know if uh, if you guys play bass at all, or if you have friends who play. I'm sure you have friends who play bass. But I do have, have friends, and I have a friend that has every single Mark bass amp. Oh, really? Is that right? right? Every single one. Yeah, I've got a couple that have a couple, and uh, you know, I I actually uh, am good friends with the guy that helped break them here, Mitch Colby. Yep. Mm. So um, yeah, he used wow. to Mitch was like Marshall guys for years and years, and they they had this product and they wanted to break it in the U.S. and they actually brought him in uh, after he retired from Marshall. They brought him in to help break the uh, the, the mark, mark base. base yep. In this country, and uh, he did which a great means job. he he had to have been a pretty big player in the Guitar Center hookup. He probably because that's really probably what, yeah. It's because yeah. Guitar Center is what really what, once you get that account. You're, mm -hmm. you're on your way uh, but their stuff 
their bass stuff sounds incredible. I mean, it really does. I'm, yeah. I don't I don't play bass a lot, but I do play enough occasionally and mix bass enough to know that the combination of a round sound with all that focusness is one of the hardest things to achieve. You know, it's usually like it's like, it's like you're either going to have articulation, therefore your tone will be Jocko, you know, bridge position, no bass, mm -hmm. or you're going to, you know, sound big, which means we won't understand anything articulate that you do. Um, they really have that balance that's, it's round, it's big, and at the same time, it's very focused. And, you know, it's not like bass players have never gotten that prior mm -hmm. to them, but, but to get it that easily by just plugging in, you know, usually, right. you know what I mean? Without some weird compressor and this other rack gear thing and some other special preamp, uh, to just be able to plug right into an amp and have it do that, I really think that that's why I think that the company became so big in the bass thing because they simply had a great product. They did, um, and and uh, uh, pretty damn lightweight too. Yeah, yes. incredibly Very lightweight. Yep. Yeah, all their stuff. I don't know what they do. I don't get that thing. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's, it has to be Neo drivers. I'm pretty sure they're Neo drivers. Yeah. But their cabinets so. are very light, but they, they sound good too. You oh, know, yeah. it's, they, they, yeah. don't, they don't sound like a piece of cardboard, you know? Nope. Right. Not at all. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, I mean, they're doing guitar amps now. We, they only started the bass, but they're doing guitar amps now. And that's where you come in. Yes. So they, they contacted me uh, maybe three, three years ago. And, um, I, I had become kind of frustrated in general with a lot of things with the industry, with the music products industry. It's a, it's a, it's a luxury problem, I suppose, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a tough First world thing. problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough to main, it's tough to find the correct dynamic in these relationships because, you know, an artist, my idea of an endorsement deal has always been, let's just come together and make sure that whatever we do for each other it's it's in the spirit of mutually beneficial so anything that i do for you is going to be a benefit to both you and me and whatever you're going to do in my behalf will be not only a benefit to me but you know indirectly a benefit to you mm -hmm. so let's just do that let's not get into these you know when what if i get with a company and the first thing they say is so uh the way we do it here is that you'll get uh, four uh, guitars per year, and then uh, with, you'll perform at these trade shows, and we'll do X amount of clinics. I almost immediately am turned off because it's like, why would there be a policy? I thought let's get together and try to do some great thing together. Let's why why would there be a policy? Mm -hmm. Let's, I mean, to be honest with you, and I said this to Laguna, and I said this to other companies as well. I'm not interested in free gear. In fact, uh, you know, I've, I'm I'm in a, a like a 2000 square foot house here. I'm not, it's not, a, I'm not in a, some gigantic place. Uh, I'm running out of room. You know, I, I don't have any, I actually don't want any more gear. <laughs> so, uh, I'm That's not funny. here because I'm looking for free stuff. Mm -hmm. I have so many freaking guitars and amps. I, I'm here because I'm thinking that we could, if we get together, we could do something really cool. You know, that my name could bring maybe some extra credibility to your company and your uh, support and acknowledging that I've come on board can can be good for me in terms of promotion. And and we can work together to you know, to come up with a product that we really sincerely believe in and that people will, that you know, the potential consumer can be a, ben, you know, a beneficiary. And and I really mean it when I say that it's like otherwise, why am I here? Because, I mean, I don't need guitars. Mm hmm. So why would I come here? I mean, that, that's the bottom really line. Refreshing to hear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> why else am I here? If <laughs> if I if I don't need guitars, and you certainly don't really need uh, me. I mean, it might be nice for you to have me, and it might be nice for me to have a new guitar that that's you know more that's closer to a, a perfect instrument for me. But if that's not the goal, then what what are we doing? Mm -hmm. You know. And and I literally said that to Laguna when we got together. We they had really got they had tried to get me to come on board for a while. We finally sat down, and I literally I remember we went to dinner with the two reps they had at the time. And I sat down, shook hands, and they said, "So, Greg, what what are you what are you interested in?" And I said, "Well, actually, this was your idea." <laughs> I said, "But now that you've asked, I I, have, I can tell you this: I'm not interested in free guitars. That's what I'm not interested in. So let's just start the conversation from here." Because 
if we're going to get together, I want it to be real. I want to have a relationship. In other words, that's just how it is for me. When it comes to getting together with a company in the hopes that our merge makes the, you know, makes the end result better than, you know, bigger than the, mm-hmm. the parts, yeah. then, uh, then that's the goal. Let, let's just make that the goal. Let's not, you know, don't come at me with, you'll get four guitars a year. And another <laughs> thing, uh, you, you do these cl- many clinics because, because there's no passion in that. You know right. I mean? That's like, right. that's yeah. like writing a it's song. An, it's an obligation or, you know, it's a, yeah. it's, a it's a business deal. It's, it's exactly, more, yeah, yeah. you know, exactly. Good on you, man. Yeah, that's yeah, so cool. Th- so I was happy, you know, it, um, DV Mark approached me. They told me that they're starting to expand from bass into guitar. And uh, they thought that I'd be an ideal guy to come on board. And they sent me some amps and I, I, I played them. And I said, respectfully, I think these are these are cool amps, you know, but there's really not there's nothing here really for me. They had a lot of really cool, clean amps and they have a, a, like, a lot of really cool, super heavy metal stiff rectifiery you know mm. new metal yeah. amps that would be ideal for seven and eight string stuff but not a lot in between like they didn't have just an amp that sounds i don't know like a like an old school marshall like old, what you want an amp to like sound what like. i like right, yeah. right, right exactly. exactly and so i said i said that to them so i basically said you know thanks guys but but no thanks there's really nothing here so then they mm-hmm. came back to me and said well what would you need it you know in order for to play one of our amps and, and i just said well i need i need an amp that i would like <laughs> and that, that that's narrows really it down <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's kind of what i what my thought was next my thought was that doesn't narrow things down much so in addition to having said that to you i will also say that if there's any chance of us doing something together it's going to have to happen because you flew me out there and we got to work together on this. We can't be, I can't be describing to you in an email what I like. And then you send me an amps four weeks later and I play it just as, could you tweak the the mid range and send it back? And Mm -hmm. you know, that's ridiculous. So they were totally open to that. In fact, they were excited about it and they just said, yeah, we'll fly you out here. Cool. Let's let's do this. That's very cool. So we got together and, and it was a series of trips out to beautiful Pescara, Italy, which is really one of my favorite places wow. t- to be. And their factory is located right there. And uh, oh, God. it was all, it was almost disappointing when we got done with the amp finally, because it <laughs> meant that they're not going to be flying me out there anymore. <laughs> you go, Hey, there's one more thing. That was right. No, wait, it's still not right. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm really into this like checkerboard, uh, uh, mm-hmm. AC cable, right? But I got to see it in person. <laughs> I got to see that in person. That's right. It does. The pictures do not do it justice. <laughs> wow, that's that's quite awesome, man. And that's I've seen awesome I've seen them to do. I've seen the demo video I that he too. that he's done. I have too. Very, oh, cool. Very cool, cool amplifier. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely uh, built for six strings tuned to standard tuning. Yes, it know? definitely is. And it, a, it got a yes. good cut through on that mid range. Mm-hmm. You know. Yep. It sounds yeah. like a real guitar amp is supposed to sound. Yes, it does. <laughs> it, it sounds cool. And and actually, when I was in Pescara last time, we did some tweaks on it um, even more. It actually sounds it actually sounds way better now. Oh wow! Uh, mm. Than it did. So I don't know. We're actually thinking about maybe doing a re-release or not a re-release, but a second version, oh. or maybe just calling it something different because there were a couple of pretty mon- you know uh, significant improvements that we made in the tone. Cool. So. Nice. We'll have to see. We're still thinking about how we're going to do that. But yeah, th- what I really love about the company is that even if we don't get things totally right or if if there's issues, you know, we, we have a relationship. So, you know, Marco, he's the owner of the company. He may do suggest things that we don't care for. And we'll say, well, you know, Marco, I don't really think that. And he'll listen, you know, or we may do something that pisses him off and he'll <laughs> he'll tell he'll tell us and we'll say, Okay, well, this is why, we, you know, and then we all get together and we hug, and it's all just, you know, it's a family vibe. It That's really cool. is, and and it really feels like the only real agenda that we have is to just stick together and see if we can make the music products world a better place every single day. I know that sounds really cheesy, but it's really the way it feels, because there isn't. He knows I'm not looking for. I don't need amps. I got <laughs> amps galore. I got guitars galore. He doesn't need artist really he's got a very successful company but but we like each other and that's cool man maybe something cool can come yeah, shit that's the way it's supposed to work that's supposed yeah. To, yeah me too that's awesome that's yeah awesome. yeah well, and, and then of course he's got 
a company that I have I used for a very long time mm -hmm. with, with the new guitar. With the new guitar. Oh, are you you're a carbon guy? I I had a I had a DC one twenty seven that they did a very cool custom thing for me where I'm like a one volume guy. I don't like the tone knob stuff and all. And they oh, cool. they actually eliminated it. And, and, wow. the, and the coil taps on that guitar. So I had a three-way and a volume. It was the only one I've ever seen like that. Wow. Dual humbuckers, mm -hmm. of course, neck through and all. But I mm -hmm. played that guitar solely for 17 years. Never, no, no other guitars. Wow. And, and wow. never had a moment's trouble with that thing. It, it, yeah, you, you were telling me. It was just, you know, they, they built them right. And when I saw you come over there, I was like, no way. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that, that's just way too cool. And I take it they, they work with you the same way. They do. It's really cool to work with them. Um, even though the company's going through a lot of stuff right now, they have a lot of uh, big changes happening. I think the guitar portion of the company is separating itself from the rest, really? from the pro audio. Is that is that the Kiesel side or? Yeah, I think Kiesel is, is going to, you know, the guitar is going to adopt the sort of Kiesel thing. Mm. Oh. Um, okay, we were right about that, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> I know, I just, it's reading. It's only, I'll read once in a while. Yeah, but it's it's sort of like you know I came on board smack in the middle of this, so it's, it, 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 there's a little bit of ambiguity in in terms of is this carbon key? So what's going on? Mm, yeah. There's a little confusion out there because it's a transitional phase for them right now. But through all of that, um, it was very much the same thing. You know, Jeff Jeff was just like, we want to build you a guitar that's exactly what you would want. Um, and he understood the same thing. I actually held out for a couple of years. They had been, we had been talking for like two, maybe over two years. They'd call me periodically and just say, Hey, what do you want? You want to come over? And I just, I, you know, I had just gotten through this ugly thing with Laguna, which I'm not even going to bore you guys with, but yeah, Laguna to, to make a long story, very short Laguna basically ended years ago. Um, and I sort of, uh, held up this uh, image of the company still existing by oh. by playing that guitar a lot because i was really you know i don't want to get into it but i've had so many disappointing endeavors with companies where we have these big plans and then the next thing you know they change their whole format oh. mm. you know fender we want you to come on board hm strat blah, 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 blah. and then two years later less than two years later when the whole seattle thing came in you know, fender kind of decided well, we don't really need this guitar anymore. Nobody's playing these guitars. All mm -hmm. the new bands are playing semi hollow bodies and Rickenbackers and <laughs> and weird looking old things and and uh, yeah. we should just you know Telecasters and Stratocasters is actually what these guys want. So let's go back to that. So the HM thing didn't last very long. Yeah. So we and don't so, need to support it, nor its endorses. Right. Yeah. That's exactly We're just going right. to run it through a wood chipper. Right. <laughs> yeah. And th this type of thing has happened time and time again. It happened with Laguna. Um, Laguna, I, I, I really tried my hardest to be as clear with them as possible. And I said, you know, please don't pull the rug out. If I'm going to make this commitment, I mean, it's already risky getting with a company whose name is Laguna. You know, I mean, it's already weird. So <laughs> if we're going to do this, let's make sure that the, 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 the guitar is great. Let's make sure that we have a real game plan here. Let's make sure that we're going to stick together and, follow, and see this through. And, and if so, I will get totally behind it. I, I really believe in the guitar. I believe in what uh, Keith Brawley had done and by creating the line. But in 2008, when the when the financial thing hit, mm. you know, Guitar Center cut back on, on everything. Guitar Center owned Laguna. So oh. I, I don't know if a lot of people know that. No, so, did not know that. Yeah. So in 2008, when Guitar Center sort of, you know, completely revamped their whole yeah. financial thing, Part of what happened was they just went right back to sticking to their tried and true accounts, and it's like, what? What is Keith Brawley left? So Keith Brawley had just, had sort of initiated the line of of Laguna, and mm -hmm. he then was no longer at the company, and he had been part of the buyer's department. So I think Laguna or Guitar Center just was kind of looking at this whole thing, going, well. You know, we're going to cut way back on our inventory, so that that's why when you go into Guitar Center now, it's kind of like the mantra is. We don't have it in stock, but we can get it for you. Right? <laughs> yeah. So inventory was one of the things they cut back on. And then anything that seemed unnecessary, they cut back on. And Laguna to them was, was nothing more than just a little project for, for Keith mm -hmm. mm. that they were just not interested in. They had no interest in Laguna whatsoever. Wow. And so they just kind of ended it. And I, I didn't want to come across as the guy that looks like he's jumping from company to company to company. 
So I just kept playing the guitar, even while Carvin was asking me to come on board. I was just like, man. And I said the same thing to Carvin. If we're going to do this, guys, can we please? <laughs> it's, let, see, let, I mean, let, it's, let, it, it's, let's get it. Yeah, go it's ahead. It's quite obvious that this becomes personal to you. Sure. It does become personal because I really am a loyal person. And I, I put my my heart and soul into to an idea. And when, and when I'm counting on people, I try to be exactly what I would want them to be for me, mm -hmm. you know, re reliable right. and loyal and enthusiastic and honest. You know, that's the thing. I, I, that's what I bring. If I, you know, I'm not going to tell you that this is the greatest product in the world unless I actually believe that. And I'm not going to tell you that I'm excited to be here unless I actually am. So let's make sure that it is the best product and let's make sure that I am excited. And then if that's the case, I promise you that will reflect in every interview and every picture you see. And I will, I will be a, I will be a guy out there pushing this product with full genuine passion. Wow. But it's cool, man. That's yeah. That is know, awesome. Yeah. See, it's, at, just, it's at East coast, bringing up. It, it, it is at East coast, bringing up. <laughs> yeah. Man. You see? Yeah. yeah. We got the same thing. He's a stand up guy. Right. <laughs> well, I, it's it's good and bad because I I because I'm that way. I do take it very personally when I find out that suddenly a relationship is going to end because of some sort of financial thing or business deal or because of some politically based, some mm -hmm. politically motivated yeah. idea. It it really feels empty when that happens to me. It's like, man, I thought we were, yeah. I thought yeah. we were in this together. You yeah, know, we, I thought we were. We were going to really do this. And don't, don't make me feel like a line item. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know? It's like, yeah. oh, we don't need that one anymore. Well, right? I, yeah. I, I think you're safe with Carvin. Those guys have been around for a long time. I think so. And, and they very, seem really cool. Yeah, and they're mm -hmm. very established. I mean, you know, they build... You buy a guitar sight unseen through yeah. a catalog or online or whatever. And let me tell you, I got the guitar. It was tuned down a half step, like I told the guy. Mm -hmm. It was exactly the way I wanted it built. That's and, great. And, and I didn't touch the truss rod for 17 years. Wow. You know, what do you do? Right. I mean, at that point, you're going, well, obviously, they know what the hell they're doing, and they're yeah. not putting crap out the door. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, when you go on some of these forums, I've seen some of the bad mouth, and I go, well, I know who that's coming from. That's a PRS user. And yeah. I'll, I'll put that out there. I know they're in our backyard, mm -hmm. but that's exactly what that is. Because Carvin, Carvin does some things where they kind of, you know, they, they see what's working and they go, they, you know, they go a little in that direction, but they have their own flavor to it. Right. 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 And, and yeah. everybody, look, <laughs> it's the same thing for almost anything. Everybody's kind of taken from where it all started. I mean, Absolutely. sure. sure. You and, and, you know, hopefully they'll get this, this Carvin Kiesel thing figured yeah, out. Well. You know, I, I know, you know, that's, that's the... That's the founder's name, you know, and sure. they're play, paying homage to him. And they, and they, honestly, they were guitars first, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. they did Hawaiian guitars. Yeah, is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah, they back in like the forties. Yeah, and they were they were in some other location before they moved back to California, where they've been forever. Yeah, um, yeah. and then changed the name to Carbon when they moved back to California, from what I remember yeah. reading. And the whole thing about them is they sell direct, and that's why they're cheaper. It's not cheaper yes. quality. No, they, they just get right. rid of the music stores that are putting the 40% on right. it or whatever it is. Right. So when you look at it, you can be pretty sure that you're going to get something good. And if it's not, they make good on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I like that you said that because you're absolutely right. Getting a $1,500 guitar from Carvin is would be the equivalent to getting like a $2,500 guitar. Or a $3,000 mm -hmm. guitar. Yeah, $3,000 yeah, guitar, yeah. yeah. In a, you know, from a different company in yep. a store. Um, so you dig yeah, it? they do it right. I mean, they really do know how to make guitars. And their stuff is really high quality. Uh, there's a there's a strong emphasis on on really seeing to it that that's always the case. And I really feel that because you know Laguna was that was a nothing against Laguna. Laguna was cool, but there's a there really is a very noticeable quality difference when you when you're getting stuff from from Indonesia or from China mm. um, than there is when it's made right here. I mean, it's a different you know, people are a little more motivated when they're when they're uh, they're getting paid, and yeah. Yeah. it's not just uh, you know four dollars a week to, to yeah. put circuit boards. Today. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and right. a lot of those guys that work at the American factories are guitar players. Exactly. So they're yeah. into it, and right. you know some of the some of the overseas stuff. They're just 
they're just that's a job. Right, it's just right. a job. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. You know, they're trying to put right. food on the table. It's a different yep. different ball game. Yeah. Right, it really is. Yeah, and you're right. A lot of the guys at Carvin, in fact, um, some of the guys I deal with, um, aside from just Jeff, who are literally, you know, putting guitars together at the factory, they are players, and some of them are really good players. So yeah. it's it's. Uh, I think you're absolutely right. It's it's more than just this is a job. It's this is a passionate job. This is something that I. I love doing, and I, and I'm I you know and because I'm proud of it. I want to make sure that people get this guitar and they feel good about it because that reflects me. Well, yeah. that, that's pretty cool. It sounds like you're with two very passionate companies. Yeah, now. With, you know, yeah. good on you, man. That's that's got to feel good. Yeah, so. it does. It really does. Cool. Uh, it really is great. Cool. Well, that that is awesome, man. And um, I I hope they um I hope they keep working out for you. Yeah. You know and. Uh, that, you know, you keep uh, you keep being happy with the product, and you know you get to uh, you maybe in a couple of years go back and uh, you know prototype a, a new amp in uh, in Italy. You know? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I will tell you this: we tell everybody this, Greg. Uh, your your links to all your stuff will be on uh, on the show page. Excellent. And yeah. it will live there in perpetuity when it goes into the archives. And, uh, cool. you know, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we link to everything that's out there. And for sure. Any, know. um, uh, what's, what's the newest product out there that, uh, you want to tell everybody about? I have, uh, my instructional thing that I've been talking about for years is coming out this year. It's been, ah. com it's been coming along really well. It's a, it's a real comprehensive, hmm. uh, you know, study probably it's at least a two part series, if not three, um, that will get into you know, all the realms of composition and write and, and soloing, obviously. Um, cause I haven't had an instructional video since that one I did with REH, which is like in 1990 or something or 89. Wow. And you're not getting that on DVD. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I've changed so much since then and I've learned so much since then. And, uh, I'm a literally a different player. So it would be really nice, uh, to finally, you know, get in there and, you know, here's what happened with these songs that you've, grown familiar with on introspection or parallax or five here's how things are happening here's how i'm thinking about here's how i think about the fretboard here's what seems to work when it comes to becoming inspired or here's some great ideas that you can try over altered chords you know just different um concepts that aren't that are you know obviously there'll be some here's how i play here's the technique but it's going to be focused much more on the music cool. and it's uh, I'm really excited about it because it's it's coming out really nice. So it's cool. That's that's awesome. Everybody needs to pick up a copy, including me. Yeah, I definitely <laughs> want to hear it. And oh, one more thing I do want to touch on before we leave. Um, we we were doing a little prep, and Mick had me listening to um, uh, Evergreen is Golder. Uh, Evergreen is Golder. How, right? How's Marigold doing? And is it, are you guys are you know touring or doing anything? Um. Well, right now that's that project's a little bit on the shelf because. It was that important for me to get this instructional thing out. I've been promising this for a long time. Mm. Um, and also there's a couple of things happening uh, in the band that I'm not going to get into right now. The, uh, so it's I'm not exactly sure what's going to happen with the second album when it comes to Marigold. But in a perfect world, there'll be a second album for that. But uh, if not, there will certainly be a new instrumental album within the next six months. So it's either going to be the new Marigold or the new instrumental. <laughs> well, that's so, cool, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure either e one. I'm sure either one's going to be great. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Cool. That's very, very cool. Well, Greg, thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, I, man. you know, like I said, I know you're busy. I really appreciate you taking so much time with us. And uh, it's my pleasure, really. It, it was great. Hope you had a good oh. time. It was really fun. Yeah. Awesome. Really cool. Awesome, I, I'm awesome. I'm done now. This is my last show. <laughs> <laughs> I've talked to who I wanted to talk to. There you uh, go. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Well, Greg, awesome. thank you again. Have a great rest of the evening and um, much continued success. And uh, if you or Marigold come around to the East Coast, uh, we'll be on the lookout for you, man. Yeah, man. Absolutely. I appreciate it very much. Very Thanks cool. a lot, you guys. Very cool. Thank you. thank you so much. Take care. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> well, and there you have that story. That... Is, um, is cool it, yeah I, and uh yeah he's he's been around for quite a while been on my radar for quite a while and i've always liked yeah. what he's done and like he said he's grown as a player which is which is really awesome and, and you know i when i said you know i'm done mm -hmm. uh he was one of the ones he's one of the ones on this list uh-huh you know i have this list that's running in my head and he's one of the dudes because 
he he's an older guy you know I mean, he was uh, he was born in '63. He's 51. Well, he, he was around from the right. earlier earliest days of, of shrapnel. And, yeah, you know, and and just uh, just you know, he's he's that pillar guy. You know, he's mm-hmm. one of those dudes. And and but he's and it's so funny because he he does the shred, but he does it he does it tastefully, man. Yeah, yeah. And that's the cool thing. I can still listen to that album all these years later, and I'm like, man, that is so cool. Yeah. Just some of the cool riffs in there. Just uh, check that album out. Oh, for you sure. Know? You know, and he's, he's he's he seems like a guy. Well, he's got to be. He's a guy with like his heart and his mind in the right place. You know, yeah, and, and he's not one of these guys that's up for BS. And I like that. right, right. You know, he's a straight shooter. Yeah, his you know? uh, his heart and mind are in the right place, and the uh, yeah. fingers are in all the right places uh, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't, we should have asked him about the wiggle, but you know. Oh when, yeah. When he wiggles those notes, I just think it's always wild. But that's <laughs> his little thing. That's his technique. You know? Right, right. That, that's, that's his, his little signature. Right. Yeah. That's his little signature, and uh, and that's cool. Everybody should have one. I yeah. gotta figure out one one of these days, but I don't know. <laughs> Mine you know? is just when I'm signing uh, the check to the company that's charging me. It's the only signature. <laughs> uh, there he is. <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of those signatures too. <laughs> So until next time, my friend, it's going to be a good one. I am Mick Marcelino. And I'm still Jeff Bober. And we are always saying onward. Be sure and follow the show on Twitter at Amps and Axis. Also, make sure you like the show on Facebook for news, comments, and everything else, visit the webpage, ampsandaxiscast.com. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.